We are going to continue with this. We're joined by Phyllis Bennis, fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies and author of Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict. And she's joining us live from Washington, D.C. Ms. Bennis, always a pleasure to have you with us on Al Jazeera. I want to ask, firstly, your reaction to this attack and, again, the timing of it. Do you agree with our previous guest, Maureen Rabani, who was saying that this might be Israel trying to give Hamas what he called um, a bloody nose before any real progress is made on this peace plan that's been worked on by the United Nations, by Egypt, to really de-escalate those ongoing tensions in Gaza? Well, I think that's certainly a possibility. Muin's right that that is often an Israeli uh, approach here. I think what's perhaps more important than the specifics of the timing is the fact that regardless of the timing, Israel knows it can count on United States support for these actions, that they will not be held accountable, that the U.S. will guarantee some level of impunity for these kinds of attacks, even when it flies in the face of international law, it flies in the face of these efforts that you're speaking of between Egypt and the United Nations to get some kind of ceasefire talks underway. Uh, so I think that broad assumption is far more important than the, the tactical considerations. Certainly, we know that there are plenty of people both in the cabinet and in parts of the security authorities uh, who are eager to see any peace uh, movement fail, who are eager to make sure that there is nothing that starts to look like a ceasefire, that want to be able to maintain uh, military control, including these so-called, the, the language they use, this racist term about mowing the lawn, uh, the sense of every several years, the Israelis believe they have the right to simply go in and kill large numbers of people in Gaza. Uh, there's this broader question of understanding that the United States will always have their back and they will never be held accountable as long as that U.S. support continues. So it's really that question, what is the role of Jared Kushner, uh, what is the role of the Trump administration that's more important, I think, than the specifics of the timing. And Israel has, of course, always been able to count on the U.S. for support. But do you think that that's really um, escalated since the Trump administration has been in power? Do you think that this administration and with the moves that it's carried out, moving the Israeli embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, going against international law, cutting so much funding to different agencies that look after Palestinian refugees, have, has this administration, do you think, emboldened the Israeli government um, to new heights to do whatever they want? I think there's very little doubt that that's the case. The United States, as you say, has always supported Israel in any sort of uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians and in the region as a whole. But also, as you note, under the Trump administration, that has escalated even further. So these explicit examples, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Jerusalem as the so-called capital of a, uh, of a so-called unified uh, Israeli state, uh, accepting as legitimate the new Israeli nation state law that essentially makes apartheid official uh, inside Israel, all of these are actions that the U.S. has either carried out or has embraced under the Trump administration. Beyond that, you have the growing... Uh, partnership between Jared Kushner, uh, who is Trump's, of course, his son-in-law, but also his key Middle East advisor and envoy, uh, along with Jason Greenblatt, but with uh, uh, Jared Kushner playing the major role, at, at the same time that he's building this very strong relationship with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who is, of course, widely seen as being responsible for, uh, for the assassination of of Jamal Khashoggi in the, uh, the Saudi consulate in Turkey, in Istanbul. So in that context, you see this sort of pattern of assassinations being carried out under the rubric of U.S. support for its allies, whether it be the Saudis, whether it be the Israelis. And the notion of Israeli continued occupation of Gaza is likely to not even be mentioned in most of the coverage and certainly in the U.S. official responses that we will soon see from the State Department, from the White House. Uh, we will see instead Israel has the right to defend itself. Right. That's the kind of litany. 
and we will not hear the words, Israel continues to occupy the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. It's a somewhat different form of occupation than before. It's not the same kind of occupation as in the West Bank. But what we see is that with the withdrawal of uh, Israeli settlers in 2005 and the redeployment of Israeli troops from inside the Gaza Strip to surrounding the Gaza Strip with a now more than a decade old full uh, um, surrounding and blockade of Gaza, which has led to a horrific humanitarian catastrophe inside, uh, you now have the situation where Israeli control is complete, including sending troops whenever they choose, in this case it was special forces troops, yeah. inside the Gaza Strip to carry out assassinations. And so we can't expect much from the United States then, but what should happen now to ensure that this raid, this Israeli army raid into Hamas is not going to lead to to an escalation that is that actually leads to the kind of you know wars that we saw in 2014 and 2012 where hundreds if not thousands of Gazan civilians were killed well this is not something that is has any capacity for the Palestinians to make that decision this is something that the Israelis will do or not do and they do so they make their decisions knowing that they will have the full uncritical support of the Trump administration that's the challenge that we face. There is no existing pressure uh, on the Israeli military or on the Israeli political echelon from their key international supporter, which is Washington. That goes to the economic support, the $3.8 billion a year of U.S. tax money that goes directly to the Israeli military. That goes to the promise to maintain protection of Israel in the United Nations. It goes to the Israeli decision that you've already referenced of cutting all of its funding of UNRWA, the most important UN organization that provides basic uh, survival, food and education and medical care for Palestinian refugees. 80% of the population of Gaza are in fact refugees. So given all of that, this is going to be an Israeli internal decision, whether they decide to use this excuse or take no excuse at all to escalate their assault as they have three times before. Uh, beginning with Operation Cast Lead in 2008 and 9, then again in 2012, and of course again in 2014, where over 2,000 Gazan Palestinians were killed. Whether they do that again is going, unfortunately, to be their decision, knowing that they will have the support of the Trump administration for whatever they may decide to do. Ms. Benes, thank you as always for your time and your expertise on the subject. We really appreciate it, especially tonight. That is Phyllis Bellis joining us live from Washington, D.C. Thank you.